Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm coming at you with another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And you know what, we've looked at quite a few Joes recently, and it's been a while since we have looked at a Cobra action figure. So we're going to change things up a little bit, and we're going to look at the 1984 Cobra Anti-Armor Specialist, Scrap Iron. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody to smash that subscribe button. I've got a lot of great vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up and you do not want to miss them. And heaven forbid, you miss the video where I review your favorite toy. You wouldn't want that to happen, so go ahead and subscribe. This is Scrap Iron. He was introduced in 1984. He was also sold in 1985. He was discontinued in 1986, and he didn't really have a replacement. There was no Cobra Anti-Tank Specialist introduced in 1986. However, in 1985, the Cobra Snow Serpent did come with a missile pod, but I would not consider the Snow Serpent to be a replacement for Scrap Iron. In 1990, Destro got a new anti-tank specialist, Metalhead. The codename Scrap Iron seems a little bit odd for a G.I. Joe action figure, even a Cobra character. To me, the name Scrap Iron always sounded more like a Transformer name than a G.I. Joe name. In the comic book, Scrap Iron is somewhat notorious for killing in cold blood two beloved characters, Candy and the Softmaster. Let's take a look at Scrap Iron's accessories, and he came with a lot of accessories, including one very large accessory. Uh, first, let's take a look at his his pistol here. The packaging calls this an RAR pistol. Uh, as far as I can tell, it is not exactly based on any real-world weapon design. However, it does have some similarities to the PM63 RAK 9mm machine pistol, which is a Polish design. The grip on the RAK was at a different angle than this, and the RAK had a collapsible stock and a collapsible foregrip. But despite that, there are some similarities between this RAR and the real-world RAK. He also came with this massive missile system which was a very large accessory to come with just an action figure. It also came in a lot of pieces in the packaging, which you had to put together, and in 1984, it did not come with any instructions. Let's look at the parts of the missile system. You can take the main box off of the base, just like that. Uh, and the base is actually three separate pieces. The four-legged stand actually comes apart in two pieces, and then there's this swivel piece that connects to the box itself. It had this very rubbery controller with a long wire that connected to the top of the missile box. And in fact, it's so rubbery, you really have to push it in quite hard in order to keep it in. The box itself has some detail on it. And of course, it came with two red missiles. These missiles also were kind of rubbery, which was nice. I wish that more accessories had this more rubbery plastic. Uh, that would have prevented a lot of breakage. Part of these red missiles were reused for another accessory, uh, the missiles on the 1985 Ferret ATV. As you can see, the front part of the ATV missile is actually a copy of Scrap Iron's missile. As I said, when you took Scrap Iron out of the packaging, he came with this very large missile system that didn't have any instructions, so you had to figure out how to put it together. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate how to assemble this thing. First, you take this circular piece with the large peg on it, and on the underside with the smaller peg, you take the smaller of the two leg pieces and you just fit that in. And then you take the larger of the two leg pieces with the larger circle there and you fit that in right on top of it. And when that's nice and snug, you take this whole assembly and put it in the hole in the bottom of the missile box until it clicks and it stays on there pretty securely. Then you take the very rubbery control wire and you push it into the hole in the top of the missile box and just kind of wedge it in there until it holds reasonably well. And then, of course, you place the two missiles in the box. And there you go. You have an assembled missile system. 
I believe this controller is meant to fit in Scrap Iron's hand from underneath like this. Uh, but it is very rubbery, so sometimes it doesn't really want to go in. You have to work with it a little bit to get it into his hand. But once it is in his hand, it is pretty secure. It's not going to fall out too easily. One major flaw with this missile system is that Scrap Iron has no way to hold it. In the comic book, he was shown holding it and firing it from the shoulder, but there is no back peg for him to carry it like a backpack, and there's no grip for him to carry it in his hand. So it is really actually a very stationary, static weapon. It seems that a back peg or a grip could have been molded onto this pretty easily without compromising the design. Let's look at the sculpt of Scrap Iron. Scrap Iron actually reused some parts from a previous action figure, Airborne. He used all of Airborne's arms, his entire arms. Uh, you can see the pads on his elbows there. And he used the lower portion of Airborne's legs. You can see the knee pads and the boots. But of course the coloring on Scrap Iron is so wildly different from Airborne that unless it was pointed out, you probably wouldn't notice that they were using the same parts. Let's look at the articulation. Scrap Iron had the typical articulation for 1984 G.I. Joe action figures, which meant that he could turn his head from left to right, uh, his arm could swing all the way up, and it could swivel all the way around. He had a hinge on his elbow so his arm could move at about 90 degrees, and he had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. His body was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside and allowed him to move at the torso a little bit. He could spread his legs apart about so far. Uh, he could move his legs at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Very prominently, Scrap Iron has on his head a very large helmet and goggles with a nicely sculpted cobra symbol on it. The helmet is not removable, which is okay. Uh, I like to have removable helmets for the G.I. Joe action figures, but for the cobra action figures, I don't really mind because most of them are trying to hide their identity, so it kind of makes sense that they would keep their helmet and goggles on. Scrap Iron has a very vibrant blue and red and black color scheme which I think really is very distinctive you can really tell that he's a bad guy he looks like a Cobra agent uh, and he doesn't look like anybody else despite the fact that he reuses parts from another action figure he still looks very unique on his chest he has a padded vest which no doubt is to protect him when he's working on explosives and that goes all the way around to the back. He has a red belt and harness on his waist piece with some black pockets. As you can see, this particular example has some significant paint wear. On his vest, he has a black pouch and two black hand grenades. I really think that hand grenades were overused in the sculpting of a lot of these G.I. Joe action figures. I kind of think that hand grenades are just what they used whenever they couldn't think of anything else to put for detailing on the action figures, so you end up with a lot of hand grenades. On his right arm, he had a cobra symbol, which unfortunately on this example is mostly worn off. On his right leg, he has a sidearm with a red holster. Uh, he has black knee pads, and I've said before I really like the knee pads. I think those are a really cool feature. Uh, he has red boots, and I'm not sure exactly where you pick up red combat boots. Uh, apparently he hit the high fashion stores in London and Paris uh, to find these very stylish red boots. On his left thigh, he has sculpted on here these strange spike things, and I'm really not sure exactly what those are supposed to be. Uh, it's a nice feature, it is unique, but what the hell are they? On the right side of his face, he has a quite significant scar. That's a pretty deep scar there. In the 1980s G.I. Joe toy line, scars were usually associated with bad guys. The villains had scars. And I think that's an interesting contrast, since in 1964, when G.I. Joe was released, all of the G.I. Joe action figures all had a scar on their right cheek. Although we don't get to see a lot of Scrap Iron's face, except to see that he does look a little bit aged, we do see a little bit of hair under his helmet in the back, so we do know that he has black hair. I have to say I'm not a great fan of the head sculpt on Scrap Iron. Even though I don't mind the large helmet that's not removable, it seems like his neck is too long for the body of the action figure. I mean, take a look at that. Uh, his neck is, if you compare it to where the shoulders end, 
His neck is huge and his head is pretty darn big too, uh, even not counting the helmet on there. Just look at the size of his head, he has a huge melon. So that's a strike against this action figure for me. It doesn't look like the head is properly proportioned to the body. He has a red undershirt under his blue shirt, and on the card art, that red shirt is actually missing. So I wonder if originally this action figure was intended to have an open shirt and that was just supposed to be his chest showing. They might have chosen to change that to a red shirt because I think maybe the open shirt looks a little bit too 70s. Besides, I think in Destro's organization, only Destro is allowed to go bare chested. Let's take a look at the file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the action figure was packaged. You can see the front of the card there. And interestingly, in 1984, they were still advertising swivel arm battle grip, which was actually a standard feature on all of the G.I. Joe action figures by 1984. Up here it says, Cobra Anti-Armor Specialist, codename Scrap Iron. File name is classified. Primary military specialty, tank destroyer. And he doesn't have a secondary military specialty, which is usually listed on the file cards. His birthplace is classified. In this section it says, It is believed that Scrap Iron is a product designer for Destro's Armaments Company. Carries out initial field testing on all new armor-piercing munitions and submunitions. Area of specialization is remote-launched, laser-guided, rocket-propelled, piezoelectric, fused anti-tank weapons. Now that's a mouthful. I looked up piezoelectric uh, just to find out what it meant. And piezoelectricity is essentially just electricity that results from pressure. Now that I understand what piezoelectricity is, I still have no idea how it applies to anti-tank weapons. Continuing, this says, These weapons are categorized beyond the smart stage and are known by the nomenclature brilliant. Oh, real brilliant. This footnote says, Current state-of-the-art Miltech terminology, just in case you thought brilliant meant, you know, just brilliant. Brilliant is a technical term. This quote down here says, Scrap iron is methodical and precise. In perfection in any form repels him. Perhaps that's why he wants to blow up the world. Scrap iron is a very distinct action figure and very memorable. He wasn't used too well in the comic book or the cartoon, which I think is unfortunate because he seems like a really interesting character. The figure and the accessories have some flaws, which means it's not one of my favorite. It's about middle of the pack. But even so, it definitely is very unique. You have to admit, there's nobody like Scrap Iron, except for a little bit of Airborne. That was my review of the 1984 Scrap Iron. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. That's what it's there for. But whatever you do, make sure you subscribe because I've got a lot of great videos coming up and you do not want to miss them. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you all later.